Hey, what's up APR history students? Just a couple quick things before we get started. First of all, hi. Second, as I'm sure you're aware by now, this course centers around a set of 250 works of art called the Image Set, which you're expected to know pretty well. And each of these pieces of art includes a title, an artist, a location, a culture, a date or date range, and a medium. Throughout these episodes, I'll be doing my best to include as many of these works of art into our unit by unit breakdown, but just know we won't be able to include them all. And please note that when we do include them, the info card which pops up will look like this, unlike the vocab info cards, which look like this. That being said, enjoy the video. Hello, I'm Mark Martinez, and welcome to the premiere of student-led art history. In this series, we're going to break up the entirety of the AP art history curriculum into digestible little pieces. I hope you all are ready, because this episode is about global prehistory. So strap in, and let's get going. First, we're going to set the stage for art making. And to do that, we're going to provide a little bit of context about what prehistory actually is. Prehistory is divided into three major time periods. We start off with the Paleolithic or Stone Age, so far the longest period in human history. It lasted for 2.5 million years and is marked by Homo sapiens forming hunter-gatherer nomadic groups and beginning the use of stone tools. And people got around during the Paleolithic. Around 40,000 years ago, humans migrated across Beringia, which was a land bridge connecting Eurasia and the Americas. But well, there's a little bit more to it. Archaeological evidence suggests that people might have arrived thousands of years earlier by boat, and then traveled south along the Pacific coast. This isn't to say that the only people moving around were coming to the Americas. The Paleolithic also featured many migrations all across the continents of Africa, Europe, and Asia. This period is followed by the Mesolithic, starting in 9600 and ending around 6000. The Mesolithic period marks the very first evidence of settlement and permanent societies. And while the people still primarily relied on hunting for their main food supply, we see the beginning of small-scale farming. Then finally we see the Neolithic period, which ends around 2200 BCE. And the Neolithic is where this whole farming thing really blows up. We see true domestication of plants and animals during this time period, and far more permanent settlements than in the Mesolithic. These time periods aren't consistent across geographical locations, though. Farming emerges much earlier in the Middle East than in Europe, and also emerges fairly early in places like China. And these people flock to river valleys like it was nobody's business. We see this all across the world, and it's no silt grit. Why? Yes, silt. When rivers flooded, they would deposit fertile silt deposits along their deltas. This was most famous in Mesopotamia, the land between two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. But even though it isn't until the Neolithic when we see a lot of permanent settlements, that doesn't mean people weren't making art before. And this brings us to our first work in the image set, the Apollo 11 stones, so-called because they were out of this world. Actually, they were just found around the same time as the space mission, and unlike the moon landing, these stones are real. These were made about 27,000 years ago and show some of the earliest human-created art. But what is art really? Well, historians have been duking it out for centuries, and there's still not really a clear answer. Luckily, I don't have to answer this question, but that doesn't mean there aren't a lot of things across art we can use to categorize things as art. For example, largely art is created with a purpose, be it religious, aesthetic, or for personal enjoyment. Art can express beliefs, events, or values. And these can make things art, being a form of human expression. But let's not fully abandon the Apollo 11 stones just yet, because the first type of art in this unit is portable. And the Apollo 11 stones are a great example of this. And though it can be hard to pin down cultural usage, portable art across cultures is typically religious. This includes works like Camelid Sacrum in the shape of a canine from Mexico, which could have had ceremonial purpose. And this work is a good jumping off point to the fact that art historians don't really know what they're talking about. Kinda. Being that we are in prehistory, meaning there is no writing, it can be very hard to draw conclusive interpretations about these works. And especially in the case of the Camelid Sacrum, it's primarily through analysis of later cultures in these same areas that we can make any kind of real guess about what these objects mean to the maker or their culture. But moving along, there were other works that were quite small that were intended for religious use, but don't fit the category of portable art because they didn't get around a whole lot and instead they fit into a category of funerary objects. Now one through line you'll definitely see to the next unit is complex funerary rituals. And though some of the specifics can be very hard to pin down, we can make claims that these works were in fact funerary through citing. Now citing is simply taking where an artwork was found and using this to draw meaning. And across various burial sites, there are tons of art representing different values and forms. And an art form is just how a work is composed and organized. But, back to death, why would you want to be buried with an object that was expensive if you could have had it while you were alive? Well, objects such as these likely carry some sort of significance to another life, 
but of course the details can get spotty because this is prehistory. And if you were wondering why we hadn't specifically clarified until now what the word prehistory means, it's because I was holding out to tell you that it dates back to about the time when your mom was born. But also it's just a blanket term, meaning before written records. Now written records doesn't mean you have to develop your own writing system like cuneiform or hieroglyphs, it just means you have to be recording in some way, and art can be a great way to do that. But quite a lot of problems arise in classifying prehistory. Can it mean that a group of people without writing aren't creating history, or they have a lesser cultural value? Well it's certainly and conveniently has to some people, and denying the term civilized to different groups seems to pop up a lot throughout history. But back to the art. Honestly, little stones are cringe. Let's talk about really big stones. And these are called megaliths, a good example being Stonehenge. And works like this are so important because they demonstrate early organization, division of labor, and transportation of materials. Now Stonehenge is from the Neolithic time period, meaning the people who created it were practicing agriculture, and were able to develop a surplus. And with this, they're able to devote their time to things other than farming, like moving around really big stones. But beyond being so big, Stonehenge is also famous for being one of the first implementations of post and lintel structure. So I guess we are supposed to tell you how this works, but it's literally very straightforward. And this system of vertical posts supports a horizontal lintel. We'll be seeing this as the foundation for the seemingly overcomplicated architecture in the next couple of time periods. But you know, big stones get too much attention. I mean, they aren't even colorful. And pretty. You know what is colorful and pretty? Cave paintings. One example of this is the Great Hall of the Bulls in Lascaux. Here the animals are rendered in twisted perspective, meaning that their bodies are in profile while their heads are frontal. And other works just like Lascaux exist across Europe and Africa, but they have slight differences in design, notation, or language. And while the function of some of these works is unknown, some leading interpretations suggest they function as a form of hunting magic in a narrative context or record keeping. And one good example of religious cave art is Running Horned Woman. And the reason this is such a good example starts with the placement. Hidden high up on the side of a mountain, this cave would have only been accessible by an elite group of religious practitioners. This is one example of why sighting matters so much, because its true function as a sacred space comes just as much from its location as its design. But speaking of design, Running Horned Woman is a really good example of stylized art. And a work being stylized simply means that it shows its subject in a way that would be different from how it appears in real life. This is a commonality in religious art because gods and goddesses would be elevated above the status of people, and this was a way to show that. But we'll get more into the differences between stylized, naturalized, and idealized art in the next couple of episodes. But now it's time to start pulling everything together. As you may have realized, the majority of the works in this unit serve religious functions. And while they do share this common theme, the way in which these ideas are portrayed change to fit the needs of different unique groups of people. And this brings us to our last major point, how form influences function. If people were constantly moving and needed spiritual objects, portable art would be made with their iconography. If they were burying someone and wanted to protect their body and spirit, they would make art to do just that. If spiritual leaders needed a secluded place to perform their rituals, deep inside a dark cave hidden away would be a good idea. No matter what their situation was, these different groups of people would create art to fit their needs, and in turn, the things they wanted to portray would shape how they would make them. And that brings us to the end of episode 1 on global prehistory. Please stay tuned for next episode where we talk about the ancient Mediterranean, but it won't be me doing the talking. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. But I won't.